Hey, good evening. Glad you are all here. My name is Ben. For those of you that don't know me, hopefully you grabbed a sheet uh, at the bar. I think maybe we have close to enough. Uh, and hopefully you grabbed some coffee. If you didn't, you can help yourself to some coffee throughout the service. Uh, if you're wondering, restrooms are through this door right on the left. There's a couple back there. Um, thanks to our baristas. I think we had Angela and Paige back there today. So thanks for serving us the coffee. Yeah, you can applaud them. They're great. Uh if you are our guest online, you're obviously having a great new experience. We've finally gotten sort of to the to the uh, rubber meets the road of the overhaul on the live stream. So it's looking better than it ever has, not only because I'm standing in front of you, but that doesn't hurt. Uh, if you are, ouch, easy, tough crowd. Uh, if you're our guest here or you're online, if you want to know a little bit more about Collective, get a little more connected, uh, there's a station back there called Connect and Support. And there are two buttons on the computers. One says Connect, the other says Support. So Connect, you get the email support. You can help financially support what we're doing here. Uh, you can stop by there or you can uh, do that online. Uh, our online community is chatting with us live, which is great. Uh, Mike and Kenny are chatting online uh, from the room here at Collective. Uh, we are on a new platform now. This week, we've switched over to YouTube Live, which is great. You can still chat with us. And then we'll be chatting face-to-face -face afterwards uh, on a Google Hangout. So those of you online, you may actually get to meet Peter Rollins face-to-face, -face, which will be amazing. Uh, if you are tuned in and you're watching, but you're not chatting, you will actually have to log in using a Google profile. It's pretty easy to create one if you don't have one, but that really enhances the experience. You can meet Kenny and Mike in the room. You can meet Lindsay and Tina and Harrison and a bunch of people online who are chatting uh, and interact in real time throughout the service. Super cool. Uh, speaking of which, what a, uh, what a really, really cool weekend. Um, Sure, we've gotten to enjoy Peter Rollins' teaching, but today Peter had his first ever public sub. Uh, so this is like a life-changing weekend, I think, for him. Um, <laughs> some conversion happening over the weekend. Uh, very seriously, though, there's a, you know, I, I get to be the voice in the face a lot of the time, but there's a ton of people around here that do everything in terms of helping, and they don't do it for thanks. Um, tonight's the Oscars, so I'm not going to make a long speech. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you. We couldn't have pulled this weekend off without you. Um, so thanks a bunch to everybody who made this weekend happen. Uh, if you missed it and you're wondering what happened, you're like, what was this weekend? Uh, Peter is here. Peter Rollins, he's a philosopher and a theologian, um, thinker, practitioner, writer. He's helping us to make sense of uh, Christianity in a post-Christian, post-modern culture. Uh, more importantly, he's helping us to make communities uh, that are living well, that are finding life beyond religious certainty, and some practices that actually draw us into honest self-discovery rather than uh, perpetuating sort of a religious veneer. So if that sounds interesting, uh, stick around. If that's terrifying, stick around. Um, he's going to be delivering his version of, uh, of a sermon tonight. And, uh, and then if you're interested in his stuff, he has books that are going to be for sale. He's got some really great work. He'd be happy to sign them. Um, so that'll be available for those who are interested. Whether you are with us remotely, online community, or you're here in the room, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, your presence here makes us who we are. So uh, welcome. And uh, now I think we got our community statement. <clears throat> we value highly the metaphor of journey. We're different people from different back places and backgrounds. <clears throat> <Excuse me. clears throat> Representing a multi-generational community. We travel different paths. Uh, so we agree not to make assumptions about the person across from us, next to us, or in conversation with us. We challenge ourselves to be a, uh, sensitive, knowing that this community includes a diverse group of people, from lifelong followers of Jesus to people who are just now open to the idea that God might exist. So, we strive to avoid offense, ask good questions, articulate, and explain our responses. We do not assume uh, fluency in Bible, spirituality, or church language, because we believe the message of Jesus is not for Christianity, but for humanity. So, we do everything in the spirit of love and grace.
Um, so now is the time in our service when we slow down a little bit and we spend some time together in silence. Um, and for those of you who are maybe here for the first time um, or haven't been here in a while, um, this is a practice that we've been doing for uh, over a year now, um, sitting in silence in community. Uh, we sit for about five minutes. And the reason that we do this, um, I think there are a lot of reasons, but one reason that we do this um, is because meditation or stillness or centering or even just pausing, um, it can actually give us an opportunity to reflect, um, maybe on ourselves, maybe about the stories that we tell ourselves, the ideas that we have about ourselves. Um, so I'm just going to read um, a few words from uh, Jack Cornfield, and it's a book called Meditation for Beginners. And he says, we, st we tell ourselves stories about what we want and who we are, smart or kind. Often these are unexamined and limited ideas of others that we have internalized and then gone on to live out. To meditate is to discover new possibilities, to awaken to the capacity that each of us has to live more wisely, more lovingly, more compassionately, and more fully. So that's part of what we hope to gain when we sit together in silence. Um, and so as we sit together tonight, we're not here to promote uh, kind of one technique over another. There are lots of different ways that you can sit. Um, and one of those ways would be to simply count your breaths. Um, so to inhale and count one and exhale. Inhale, count two, exhale. Um, and then we ask that maybe you just count to three and then start back over at one. Um, and when your mind wanders, at it, as it most certainly will, um, just gently and compassionately bring it back to the present moment. And so we'll sit in silence for about five minutes.
Hey. Some of you have been with me all weekend, so well done. We've got to the end. Um, you know, I've got to remind myself, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, you know, speaking uh, in front of people. I never, I, I never wanted to. Yeah, the first time I did it, I was terrified. It's just the, the last thing I ever wanted to do was to speak in front of a crowd. And I was awful, <laughs> really bad. And I remember once I, uh, I fell into the only speech that was somehow in the back of my mind when I ran out of things to say and started saying, I have a dream. <laughs> and and uh, very embarrassing, but uh, thankfully there weren't that many people there. Um, uh, but yeah, you, know, you do it for a while and then you kind of fall into the routine and you just start telling your Seamus stories and, and, and all of that. And, you know, I have to remind myself, the reason why I do this is because uh, I'm talking to myself. I'm not talking to you. I never, I never was. I don't have a sermon to give. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to work out my own stuff and always have been. And I've been trying to do that through reading and through, um, through life and through community. And it's personal. And the time it's not personal, the moment that this is just a job, it's the time that I have to stop and walk away. And uh, so just I was sitting there reflecting and going like, yeah, no, I, this, this is for me. This is kind of selfish. And thankfully, I get paid for this. I should be paying you. It's like personal therapy. And like, but, but I get the, 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 the therapist to pay me for it, you know. Um, but yeah, so my journey has always been about how do I live? What does it mean to live well, um, to challenge unjust systems, to, to live fully, to be compassionate, all of these things? And for me, Christianity never really made much sense as a belief system. I never really approached it like that. It wasn't against that. It just never really was the way I read it. And I never even read it as um, connected with some sort of experience.
I was charismatic for a while. And so I loved the experience, and I was in that, you know, hands down for coffee kind of thing, and was out praying for people and all of that. But it, that didn't overly appeal to me either. Um, because if you want an interesting experience, there's loads of ways to get that. You just go take drugs, whatever, you know, there's lots of ways to have an interesting experience. Um, for me, Christianity was always uh, an invitation into. Um, a religious experience, pro properly speaking, and what I mean by that, uh, not an experience of something, but that which it cha changes your experience of everything. So it's not that you know you, there's ten things in your life that you experience, and then then faith is an eleventh thing. Now you've got eleven experiences in your world where previously you had ten, but rather now you experience the ten things very very differently. That's what life is like. You don't experience your life. Life is what allows you to experience. You know, every time you try to reflect on your life, you, you kind of fall into philosophical knots. And you either become a type of Cartesian dualist and your like, mind-body problem, or, or you, it, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of biological processes, but you can never really grasp what life is, because life is, in a sense, the window or the, the place, the site from which life is experienced. So when you use the term, that term, but born again, in a sense, to be born again or to be born is to enter into a type of life. And so, what is this type of life? Um, and so, the latest book I wrote was kind of a way for me to try to find uh, a metaphor to approach what that might be. And so, I used the metaphor of a magic trick. And uh, the reason why I chose that is because in the 1600s, an archbishop called Tillotson noticed that some of the early magicians used the term hocus pocus at the key point of the magic trick. And he realized that this sounded an awful lot like hoc est corpus, which is what the priest says during mass. And Tillotson reasoned that actually the early magicians were mocking the Eucharist. They were mocking the mass, saying, you know what, these priests, they're just doing sleight of hand. They're, they're, they're pretending that they can transform bread and wine into flesh and blood. And so what they did is they said, hocus pocus at the key point in their magic tricks to kind of send it up, to say, you know what, this is, there's nothing really happening, right? Uh, in fact, actually, patter as well, which is what the magician says when they're talking, they do the patter that kind of like lulls you into a, a less attentive state so that they can do some sort of sleight of hand. Probably comes from Paternoster, which are the prayers that are said by the, the, the nuns and the monks, uh, the repetitive prayer that puts you into a trance-like state. So Tillotson you know, thought this was terrible, and he said, Christianity is not a magic trick. The Eucharist is not a magic trick, right? But actually, perhaps the early magicians were right. Perhaps, actually, Christianity can be understood as a magic trick. Perhaps communion can be understood as a magic trick with three parts. And so that's what I tried to explore. Now, in order to illustrate the three parts of a classic magic trick, I'm going to try a magic trick, right? Now then, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. Okay, <laughs> at least this is not going out live on like YouTube or something like that, which would be very, very embarrassing. <laughs> and we, uh, Clark should be doing this trick. You actually have a magician in your midst. Uh, Clark always amazes me with uh, card tricks when I'm here. Um, so this, this magic trick starts with a coin. Here we go. There you go. And uh, this is the first part of a classic disappearing act, is the pledge. The pledge is some object that is going to be made to vanish. It might be a bird or a coin or cards. And, and, and as you know from the film, The Prestige, if you've seen it, uh, if a magician makes a bird disappear, the bird that comes back at the end isn't the same bird. That first one's dead, right? He broke its neck and stuffed it up his sleeve. <laughs> we don't generally get back what we think we got rid of. But there's the pledge, the coin. The second part of the trick is the turn. And the turn is where the coin disappears. And then we wait. 
for the third part of the trick. You need the third part of the trick. When I first learned this, I didn't know how to do the third part. I never did it. And you know, people are never satisfied until the coin returns. And that's called the prestige. Right? So I learned this in Tibet. I went there when I was young and, and a holy man. I spent 10 years in, a, in an isolated village and he taught me this magic trick. So um, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. The idea is, most of you will be able to see it. This is really for the four of you, okay? But we take this coin and I'm going to rub it into kind of my arm if it works. If you've read the book, you'll, I, I start by explaining exactly how this is done, so this is not going to fool you at all. And sometimes it doesn't work, annoyingly, because if the coin's not magical enough, um, it's, uh, it just completely doesn't work. So you rub and you rub and you rub. And then, if you're lucky, ta-da, it disappears. And then, little hocus pocus, you pick up this glass and you go, there's the coin all along. Now, if you saw how I did that, right, <laughs> very simply, anybody see? I uh, was rubbing the coin and keeping the coin in my left hand, and then at one point, I put it in my right hand, place it on the back of my neck, and then if, if, you, if the pattern is right and the person is deceived enough, they don't notice the change, and the coin sits in the back of your neck. And this coin, I placed there earlier, right? So that's the trick. <laughs> there you go. I also do, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. I also do kids' parties, um, bar mitzvahs, you know, I can do balloon animals, so yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the three parts, the pledge, the turn, and the prestige. Uh, now, the way I look at Christianity, in a sense, is Christianity begins with a pledge, um, and actually, the Hebrew scriptures begin with a, an example of this pledge. In, 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 the, in Genesis, you have Adam and Eve walking around this garden, and they can have access to anything they want, right? Except for one thing. There's a prohibition, so you can't have the fruit of that tree. And it's like, oh, I really want that, right? It's like, oh, I really want that. Um, and, and this fruit becomes something magical that they really want more than anything else. Right. They want that. If I could get that piece of fruit, and I could be like a god, it would be incredible. Right? And, and for me, this is a symbol of what we can call the sacred object. The sacred object is that thing in your life that acts like that mundane piece of fruit. Whatever it is in your life that you think, if only I had that, things would be amazing. Right? If only I had that person, if only I had that job, that money, that health, whatever it is, then I would feel whole and complete. It's a sacred object. And what makes this object so special to us is the fact that we don't have it. Right? It's like a child wanting a toy that they don't have, on a, a magical uh, veneer. A child says, I want a dog, a puppy for Christmas. And you say, you can't have the puppy. You can't have a puppy. And then they're suddenly like, no, I really want the puppy. And you go, you can't have the puppy. I really want the puppy. You can't have the I'll hold my bread until I pass out. I really need the puppy. And I'll, I'll feed it every day. And I'll walk it every day. And you'll never have to buy me another present ever again. It's all my Christmas is rolled into one until I'm 18. Please just get me the puppy. And, you know, and then you buy the puppy. And uh, three weeks later, you have to drown it in the bath because they won't play with it anymore, right? You know? It's just... It's just Bad memories, bad memories. Um, no, no, um, yeah, no, I drowned it, it's fine. Um, no, uh, so this, um, there, this is illustrated, I think, in a, in a, a story that I like um, about, from Ireland. Well, I don't know if it's from Ireland, but I always make my stories from Ireland. <laughs> um, but it's about this, this high-powered lawyer uh, from New York City who goes on a holiday to Ireland. Uh, uh, yeah, don't worry, he's coming. <laughs> um, so goes to, the, goes, goes to Ireland uh, to hunt, he, and he goes to hunt ducks. I was trying to think back there, do you hunt ducks? I wasn't sure whether ducks can even fly. This is how bad I am with animals. Ducks can fly, can't they? People shoot ducks, right? Yeah. <laughs> We've got ducks in Ireland. Okay, so he's got, he goes hunting, he's hunting ducks. Anyway, he, he shoots a duck, and this duck falls into this farm, and... and so the high part lawyer, he's like, he goes over, he's climbing over the fence, and this old guy in a tractor is driving along, driving along. He says, here, mister, mister, what do you think you're doing? And he says, uh, who are you? He says, oh, he says, my name's Seamus, right? He says, 
I own this, this property. I pick up fence, that old tree stump, you know, it's all my property. You know, you can't, you can't get in there. And he says, well, I shot that duck. That duck's mine. And James is like, I'm sorry, it's like, it's my property. And the lawyer, you know, stands back up, goes up to him and says, listen, you know who I am? He says, I'm a high paid lawyer. He says, I could ruin you if you don't give me that duck. And so Seamus gets off his tractor. He looks at him and he goes, he says, ah, you're not from around here, are you? He goes, no. He says, listen, we have a, we have a, a way of resolving conflicts. It's called a three kick rule. He says, what's that? Well, he, says, well, he says, I kick you and you kick me. I kick you, you kick me three times each. And whoever gives up first loses. So this young lawyer looks at this old guy and says, fair enough, absolutely. So Seamus limbers up and stretches and he goes, right, okay, three kicks. So kicks the guy right in the side of the stomach. Ah, oh, really sore. Like, oh my goodness, this guy's got a lot of, lot of energy. And kicks him again, he's on the ground and kicks him in the groin and he's like, oh, this is awful. But he goes, I just made it, just made it. He gets up, he dusts himself down, he's in pain. He says, okay, now it's my turn. And Seamus says, no, I says, it's all right, you win. You can have the duck, right? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. um, now, that, that kind of illustrates how whenever you can't have something, it makes you really, really want it. You know, you can't, there's a duck. It's just a duck right there. But James is like, no, no, you can't have it. It's like, I really want that duck. To the point where he'll let someone kick him to pieces and they'll have a fight to get that thing. But as soon as the prohibition is lifted, it's like you suddenly realize, oh, it's just a duck. You know, as soon as James says, oh, you win, you can have the duck. It's like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> Why am I fighting for this duck? You know, when you have something that you think, if only I got that, everything would be amazing. And then you get it and you're like, oh, it's okay, but it, it doesn't, doesn't do what it said on the label, you know? And so much of our society runs on, on, on these promises, not just the religious world, which often says, come to the front and everything will be great. You'll be happy and whole and all of that. But also all the magazines and TV and everyone's selling us this in different ways. And I think that can be called the pledge of Christianity, that sacred object that we all want, whether we believe in it or not, we still act as if it exists. You know, we may not think money brings happiness, but we still act as if it does, you know. Um, well, the turn of Christianity, I think, can be expressed in the crucifixion. You see, I, th I see the temple as kind of similar structure to the Garden of Eden, right? The temple in Jerusalem had three parts. It had the place called the Court of Gentiles where anyone could go, hang out and buy and sell and do sacrifices. And then it had a curtain, a very thick curtain. Um, behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies, that, whoa, the sacred, that's where the sacred dwells, you know, wow. Um, just like in the Garden of Eden, you have the place where they, there's everything, you know, they can walk around, everything's fine, then they have a wall, a prohibition, and behind the prohibition you have this sacred fruit. It also looks a little bit like a theatre that a magician would do a trick in. You've got the audience, you've got the magician's curtain, and then behind the magician's curtain, you know, you have the object that he places or she places, rips the curtain away and oh, where is it, right? And sure enough, in Christianity, we have this moment where the temple curtain is and we see inside the Holy of Holies and oh, there's nothing there. This happened, uh, it was a, a Pompeius, General Pompeius something, I wish I could remember his name now, but a, a general who uh, saw behind the curtain Right, went behind the curtain and he came back out saying, the Holy of Holies is empty. There's nothing there, right? He had that experience. It's like when the Russian cosmonaut went up into space and reportedly said, there's nothing up here, right? People think that that's kind of the atheistic insight, that, that, that the place where you think you're going to find God or the Holy, it's not there, it's empty. But I argue in the book that that's actually the Christological insight. The place where we think the, the absolute, the sacred dwells. In Christianity, there's this realization that it doesn't exist. The sacred object isn't there. And this is the turn. But the trick doesn't end there. There has to be a prestige, a return of the object. Not necessarily exactly the same object. It looks the same, but it's just slightly different in a way you can't quite put your finger on. 
And I would say this is represented in, in resurrection, where the sacred is no longer an object that you can touch and grasp and that's just always out of reach, but rather the sacred is experienced as the depth dimension in life itself, where two or three are gathered together in love, where to know God is to love, and if you don't love God, which is a really bizarre thing to think. How can love be connected to knowledge? Only if the sacred is not something that you love, but what is discovered in the act of love itself. Mother Teresa, I think, is a beautiful example of this. When she was young, I think it was 16, she had the call. She went uh, to the south of Ireland and she uh, uh, gave her life to, um, uh, 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 the, this, to, to the nun. She became a nun. She went to Calcutta. Nothing. And she was incredibly devout. But then in her 30s, she had what she termed the call within the call. And this coincided with the loss of God. So there was the pledge, the call. She experienced God as this being who was there with her. But then in her 30s, she experienced the loss of God. And for the rest of her life, uh, she basically, with the, with the exception of a couple of weeks, just had a void, nothing there. Every time she prayed, she felt nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, her diaries are beautiful, beautifully written, and they have details of, of this experience or this lack of experience written in them. And she wanted these diaries burned. She wanted them destroyed. And people were like, why did she want them destroyed? Is there some crazy secret in there? You know, is she having an affair with the Pope? Uh, is she got the biggest collection of Ferraris? You know, what's, what's the secret? And there was nothing like that. And so people thought, oh, oh, maybe the secret was she experienced the loss of God and she didn't want people to know that. And that's, you know, commonly what people think. But, but actually, she was quite clear in why she wanted her journals destroyed. And it wasn't because she was afraid that people would, would look into her inner life and, 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 and find that she had this void and this gap. It was because she was like, that why would people want to look inside to see if they can find God? She says, you want to see where God is? Look at the children who are being saved. Look at the hospitals that are being built. Look at the people who are being cared for. For her, faith became not some experience, some thing that you felt. It was a way of living in the world. And, and in Time magazine, whenever a, a, an interviewer talked to her, she said, uh, you know, she was asked, why do you do the work that you do? Why do you commit yourself tirelessly to this when actually a lot of the people you're caring for uh, will die within days or weeks anyway? You're one person. And she said, each child is a wonderful disguise. Uh, and there's a beautiful Mike Scott song from the Water Boys called Wonderful Disguise, which is, a, which is about this quote. A wonderful disguise of the divine. Now, what she meant by that is not that I think that every time she picked up a child, uh, you know, she felt that she could kind of look behind the kid and there was God, but rather that somehow as she was holding the child because that child had infinite worth to her, she would blink momentarily and feel that she was holding Christ and then blink momentarily again and she was holding this child of infinite worth. That in her act of just loving the world, she found depth and meaning. So this comes to then kind of communion. Communion has three parts. There is the pledge, there's the wine, and there's the bread. And this is the sacred and, and form that you can touch, that you can taste, that you can see. And then there's the turn, which is the disappearance of this into your body. And it's gone, and we're waiting waiting for the prestige and we wait and we wait and then some music comes on and we stand up and we talk to the people to our right and to our left and we see someone who you haven't talked to for a while and we go listen how's life like how is it really what's going on you know, i knew you were struggling in your job like is that still bad as i know you're having trouble in your relationship how's that or and i heard you just had a kid 
and you share your life with the person beside you and you, you arrange to, to meet up for a drink and, and then without even realizing it, you're enacting the prestige. The prestige is whenever we give ourselves to one another in love, looking out for the person on our right and on our left, trying to give ourselves to good causes, trying to find depth and meaning in the midst of our lives, in the very forgetting of the sacred object, we discover something of it. This is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer, near the end of his life, he said, to live as though God is not given is to live fully before God and with God. And what he was saying was to live as though God is not given as some object, but simply to give oneself to the world, and he called it religionless Christianity. By doing that, somehow you stand in the very midst of the sacred, in the very midst of the divine. And there's no fanfare, there's no applause, the curtain just goes down, and the magician leaves the stage, and we are left to live together. We're going to uh, partake in the Eucharist tonight. Uh, rather than re-explaining what Peter has just explained, instead I'm going to actually give a very formal, traditional introduction, but I want to invite you to hear it uh, through the lens of, of this three-part move, uh, and especially the way that it's left. Uh, the, the words at the end, eat and drink and you will have life. Uh, the idea that eat and drink being the moment uh, in, in which the God uh, that we objectify disappears. And the idea that somehow uh, in that moment, the invitation to life is actually opened up. Um, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and handed over to suffering and death, he was with his best friends, his mates, right? <laughs> After having given thanks, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. In the same way, having given thanks, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do these things in remembrance of me, eat and drink and you will have life. Let's just sit with that for a moment. When you're ready, you can come and rip a piece of bread off, dip it in the cup. Uh, because there are so many of us, there's another station over there. If you'd like to uh, come to the Eucharist at that other table, you can. Um, we don't have any time constraints, so let's take our time and just kind of sit with this uh, and, and let it be the moment that it needs to be.
just me and you But if I did Fell from
The task has ended. Go in pieces. Our faith has been rear-ended. Certainty amended. And something might be mended that we didn't know was torn. And we are fire, bright burning fire, turning from the higher places from which we fell, emptying ourselves into the hell in which we'll find our loving and beloved brother, mother, sister, father, friend. And so friends, the task has ended. Go in pieces to see and feel your world. Grace and peace.